So all week long, in your various places that you've been, in school or work or in a restaurant, you've had to kind of be quiet about God. You know, you don't want to make a lot of ruckus. You don't want to get in trouble with the boss or whatever the case may be. But in this place, you can say whatever you want to the praise of, of God. So as we sang this morning about the glory of God, what did you hear? What impacted you? What was the thing that grasped you? I'll tell you mine up front is in Come Thou Fount, there's that, that line where it says, He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. He put his blood in between me and danger. That's what, that's what grabbed me the most. What did, what did you experience this morning as we worship? Talk about the glory of God. Terry. Seeing the angels here worshiping also. Yeah. Okay. What else? It is freedom. I am free. Oh, wow. And God's pretty free, right? Amen. Okay. Yeah. Even though I'm prone to wonder, He keeps pulling me back. Yeah. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And the guy who wrote that song did wander away from God. Yes. Which reminds us that our enemy plays the long game, doesn't he? He'll wait 60 years to take you out. That's why we have to finish well. What else? What did you hear? Come on, church. T t broke every chain. Tell me about the glory of the God we worship. He died for me. Yes, Robert. Even the angels want to resurrection. Yeah, even the angels. I mean, they're, they're like, what is grace? What's the resurrection? We get to experience it, and they only get to observe. What else? He rescued us. Unconditional love. Anybody else? King of kings. And not just, you know, we think of king of kings uh, of all the kings of the earth, but he's also the king of all the kings that he will appoint in his kingdom who will rule and reign with him uh, in righteousness. Wow. So think about your faithfulness. Maybe you get like Palatka. You, you get to oversee Palatka or something. But what else? What do you, what do you hear? Let's, we're not going any further, church. We're not going to play church. We're not going to do the thing and then do the thing. And then Tim talk too long and then do the thing. We're, we're here to glorify God. Yes. He is good in, in the way he is good, not necessarily the way. Yeah, he is good. He is the definition of good, not what I think of as good. And thankfully for that, right? What else? to hear us singing together, corporately praising. Somebody else? The gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not sing. Yes, yes. I love that moment where in the music it builds and we get to that place of this gospel is not going to kneel and it's not going to faint. Whatever you think is happening in this culture, whatever you think is happening around the world, the church has always persevered because Christ is the Lord of the church. And he said, I'm never, ever going to forsake you. Man, when things get bad, that's when, that's when the church gets good. Okay? Anybody else? Come on. You know, our praise forever, we think of future, but it's now. Yeah. Our, our forever is now. That's a, good, that's a good thought. That eternal life is not something we're looking forward to. We have it now. And, and it is part of who we are and where we're headed. And well, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the angels held their breath. I mean, whatever that means, right? It's just... Right, right. Anybody else? He sustains us. Keep going. Yes. Yes, yes. And in fact, for our text that we've been in, in Ephesians 4, uh, we, we mentioned the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I went back last night and, and reviewed some reading I'd done in the Quran, where it says, Woe to those who say three in one. They are worthy of everlasting fire. Allah is one, and, and, and they don't even allow for Jesus to be a son of God. And there's, in a third passage, Allah is scolding Jesus because he said that he was one with the Father. 
And we have a God three in one. Uh, don't ask me to explain it. You guys, yeah, you guys sense the importance of the glory of God in our lives? Do you, do you know that? The, the weightiness of that? That's part of what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4. You know, there's this weight of this triune God and what he's done for us that's so weighty. I want you to start to begin, he says, to, to live out a life. I'll be there with you. I will make you able. But I want you to, to strive and endure to become the kind of people that bear the weight of that story. Wow. <clears throat> so, uh, one more time, because I, I have a real reason for what I'm about to ask you. I want everybody to come in and up, okay? If you would please come in and come up. I'm going to have you uh, talking to each other for a moment or two. So come on. In and up. In spite of what you might think, that's not a power trip on my part, just to move people. Um, I have a specific reason for wanting to do this. So last week in Ephesians 4, we talked about that this, this worthy walk that we have, this walk, this walking, living out our Christian life that Paul wants us to have, uh, based upon the weightiness of all that he describes in the first three chapters, that, that, that there's certain aspects of that he wants us to do. And so the first thing is he wants us to walk in unity. So the first 16 verses of uh, Ephesians 4 are all about walking in unity. If you keep that theme in your mind, then all the, that language as you get further and further down, you know, the ascending and the descending and the, and the joints and, and the, all that working together, all of that has as a theme walking in unity. We talked last week about the fact that the basis of our unity uh, first of all, is based on the character of Christ, but not just the character of Christ, the character of Christ incarnated in us. Uh, in, the, in the church in particular in America, but I think it's true in churches all over the world, and certainly the ones I've seen in the few places I've been, um, when all said and done, more gets said than gets done. And the challenge is, as we read the scriptures, as we study them, that, that there's an action, there's a movement, there's a decision, there's a change, there's a shift, there's a transformation that God wants to happen in us. If, and let me say this very clearly, for us good old Western Greek model thinkers, if it didn't change me, I didn't learn it. This is not just like, you know, the names of flowers and, and different animals and uh, physics and all. This is, this is words from God intended to change us. So, so that the, the moral imperative of everything we read in this book is that I'm supposed to be different, or at least on the way to being different uh, as a result of reading and hearing it. That uh, character of Christ incarnated in us, uh, uh, specifically he gives there, and there's a lot of things he could have said, but these internal attitudes of humility gentleness and patience, and then this external expression of bearing with one another. So this internal character of Jesus working its way out with bearing with one another and working to maintain unity. Now I have a little discussion question for you for about two minutes. Turn to two or three people around you, one or two people around you, and answer this question. And the rule is, if you don't want to talk, that's fine. Nobody's forced to talk. But if you, this is probably the safest place you're going to talk uh, this week. Um, when you look at those things, that humility, gentleness, and patience, what experiences did you have this week that God used to drive that home? The humility, the gentleness, and patience that he's trying to build into us. My one request is don't use anybody's names, okay? But talk for just a moment about gentleness, 
humility and patience and how God worked that or attempted to work that in your life. Go ahead, talk for a minute. Boy, the husbands are looking at the wives and they're going, so maybe we should get in other groups. <laughs> Okay, let me, let me interrupt you. I, I wish everybody could stand up here and watch this. Uh, I, I love having this perspective. And there's a part of me that thinks that husbands and wives are saying, no, no, God gave me to give you patience. And she's saying, no, God gave me to give you patience. But um, I want to pray right now. I want to pray for you because... Because we need prayer for these kinds of things. Do we not need prayer for these things? Father, you're always giving us homework. And you always bring it, often in, in the ways that we least expect it and honestly least wish you would do it. So Father, grant us, grant to us humility, gentleness, and patience. And do that work in us. Give us a heart that longs more than anything, more than anything in all the world, longs to be like your son. And in that way, perhaps we can begin to cherish the moments you bring to us that work these things in us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Uh, someone said to me not too long ago in counseling, you know, you're a Christian counselor. You never, hardly ever give me any homework. And I go, well, I can do that for you. But I, I suspect that the Holy Spirit will have much better homework for you than I could ever give you. And I don't want you to be distracted by what I give you uh, so that he can work his work in you. He's always working on the, from the inside out, isn't he? And, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And hopefully we will be more like him tomorrow than we are today. That's, that's the goal. I had a, uh, just, a, just a quick... Um, review yesterday uh, some of us went to Tallahassee to be with Don and Robin St. Dennis at the memorial service of Robin's uh, dad Michael Braun who was a pastor and a teacher and a theologian and and it was epic for those of you who were there you know what I'm, I'm talking about the testimonies of the children the grandchildren and the people around the amazing reach the amazing shadow that was cast by this man over so many uh, people and I was so encouraged to be called a pastor. I walked out of there thinking, uh, I, and, I, and I always, I always think of you guys, uh, in, which with great love and, and uh, admiration and joy. But I was especially challenged uh, yesterday to remember what a privilege it is to serve you in this way, and and what a privilege it is to be able to hold this book that that millions, millions of people in the world have never seen and may never see before they go into eternity. I've got volumes of these things in my, I've got three different offices. I've got different stuff everywhere. 
God has blessed me so much. So to stand here this morning just in this place is such an honor and such a privilege. And it's in particular an honor and privilege because of who you are. And I just want you to know that that's the work that God worked in me yesterday as I listened to the story of uh, the incredible life and legacy of this man. So the basis of our unity is the character of Christ always working. And, and, you know, if you've been in church more than 15 minutes, you know the struggles that come in church. And then as you work your way through and you grow in your ministry and you get involved in the leadership level of church, you know, it can be intense at times. We've all experienced that. But there's something about uh, being in the room or being in a discussion with someone who, who's humble and who's gentle and who has been meeked by God in a way that, that all the strength of their personality is now brought under self-control, the control of the Holy Spirit, so that you can have these conversations and these struggles. Uh, struggles are not only, they're not only true, they're essential to our growth. You can't grow without tension. And so uh, I'm so glad that God doesn't just give us, you know, a list of rules to follow but he's always working in us. He's giving himself, his presence, the power of his Holy Spirit in us to change. And we also know, as we looked at last week, that this idea of the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, is absolutely essential and foundational, not only to our, our doctrine, our theology, our understanding of the Bible, the spiritual life, but the unity in the church. Here's the irony. You have a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have three different persons talking about unity. And that's why the Trinity is so critical to us because the Trinity is the model. The Trinity is the model for everything for us. It is so foundational that long before there was a cross or a Bible or Jesus teaching or even a world a created and even people falling in, before any of that, there was the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit living in eternal unity and diversity, modeling what love means. God did not create us or create the world because he was needy, because he was lonely. God created us because he wanted to demonstrate what was happening in the Trinity. He wanted us to experience. And Jesus uh, prayed for this in John 17. As he said, Father, I've finished the work that you sent me to do. He hasn't even been to the cross yet, and he's already finished one of the pieces of the work. What was that? I gave your, the, your word to them. I pray for them that they will be like you and I are. We are one, that they will be one with each other and, and with us and be that way eternally. And then that wonderful moment around verse 20, 21, where he says, I'm not just praying for these these who are sitting here at the table as we have the Passover, I'm praying for the people who will believe in me because of the work and the ministry of Peter and Paul and James and John. And every one of us came to faith as a result of the ministry of these apostles. So Jesus was praying for you. And I don't mean you like because you're part of the world, you get included. I mean, he was praying for you. Before you were ever born, Jesus was praying for you. That blows my mind. I hope that encourages you. In those moments when life is just not happening the way you want it to happen and you're falling apart and things are going sideways in 15 different directions and you, see the, you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel, remember that before this ever happened, before you ever happened, Jesus prayed for you. So we know, we know. Oh, church, be encouraged by this. We know that he, as the writer of Hebrews says, ever lives to make intercession for us. Right now, while you're sitting here, whether you're paying attention to what I'm saying or you're going through the list of things you have to get done, Jesus, our Lord, our Christ, is in the presence of the Heavenly Father, donning his prayer shawl, and he's crying out to his Father for you. For you. Not just you, for you. Can you be encouraged by that this morning? And so that, that doctrine of the Trinity is so critical, and we, we came to three conclusions. One, the unity is of, 
Unity of the church is a reflection of the nature and character of God. We said that. Secondly, we know that it was accomplished by Christ. So he's not asking us to create unity in the body of Christ. He's asking us to be eager and, and strive to maintain it. It was the cross of Christ that broke down the walls, the partitions, and brought us together. And then finally, we said that our unity is a witness to the world. Man, have we, man, do we need this in our culture. It just gets meaner and meaner and meaner. It gets worse every day. And the division that the enemy has wrought through the internet, which to me is a modern version of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can go anywhere you want, any place you want, any subject you want. And it's a fulfillment of that, that sin of Adam and Eve who, uh, who the enemy said to them, you know what? If you just had enough information, you could be like God. That's what he said to them. Eat, eat this fruit and you'll be like God. There is a need for Christians to stand above the brokenness of our culture and to speak the words, the heart, the life, the mission of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus. So that's the basis. And this morning I just want to get started on this idea of how this preservation of this unity happens in the body. Um, First of all, it says in verses 7 through 10 that Christ himself has given gifts to the church. So in verse 7, he says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, and now he's quoting uh, Psalm 68, verse 18. Uh, you can go back and check it, and he's changing it a little bit because the purpose of of why it was given in the Old Testament has shifted to a New, Test New Testament purpose. So he's quoting, therefore it says, he ascended on high, he led host uh, captives, and he gave gifts to men. In Psalm 68, if you go there, you'll see that what the psalmist is talking about is talking about the, 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 uh, the warrior king who, who is uh, victorious in battle, and as a result, it brings all the enemies, and all the enemies give gifts to him. That happened in that culture. But, but Paul takes it one step further and says not only do the captives, uh, sin and death and hell and all of that, not only do they, do they bow and give gifts to the great king that we follow and that we worship and that we serve, but he then turns and takes those gifts and he gives gifts to his children. You see the extension of that? He receives gifts, but our king is not a king who hoards things. He's not a king who sits off uh, in a palace somewhere and, and all of his uh, subjects are in poverty and he doesn't care for them. Our king is the one who takes the booty, if we can say it that way, of war and he turns and he, and he shares it with his subjects. And so he says, he ascended on high, he led hosts, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And then he explains this, uh, because uh, the people listening, oh, who's he talking about? He says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. In other words, uh, uh, Ephesians, I'm telling you about Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the king in, in Psalm 68. I'm telling you that the one who ascended is the one who descended into the earth in his incarnation and then ascended back. So it is Christ who has given the gifts to the church, and we're going to talk in the next few weeks about spiritual gifts, what the Bible, what the New Testament says about spiritual gifts. But here's what I want you to hear this morning out of this text. Look at the extent of the giving of these gifts in verse 7. But grace, now the word grace, the Greek word is charis, uh, the, the word spiritual gift, our English concept of spiritual gift comes from charismata, 
the giving of a grace in a person's life. That's where we get the term charismatic in English. So when he says, but grace was given, he's talking about a grace enablement, a spiritual ability, a supernatural ability. And you go, yeah, man, I can see that in Billy Graham, and I can see that in Tim Keller, and I can see that, man. You know, no, wait, oh, whoa. Grace was given to what? To who? Huh? Each one of us. So, and he goes on to say, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, in other words, it's Christ who gives the gifts. We learn in other places that the Holy Spirit's involved in that enabling and that giving of spiritual gifts. But Christ is giving gifts to the church, and he's giving them to all of us. So the introduction we have in Ephesians 4 to the subject of spiritual gifts is that each one of us, every person in this room, has at least one and probably several spiritual, supernatural superpowers. I'll say it in modern, modern English. Superpowers. The ability, as my son James likes to say, you bring the natural and he'll bring the super and he'll make it supernatural. Really? I mean, you see that, think of the people that, that have ministered to you over the years. I, I sat there listening to these people talking about Mike Braun yesterday and just the incredible spiritual giftedness he had to teach the word and to exhort and to counsel and, and to lead and so forth. And I thought, that man, that's spiritual giftedness. Uh, and, and they weren't saying Manny was a good guy and he had all these talents. They were saying God used him in a supernatural way in my life. Do you, do you believe that that's true about you, that you can be used by God supernaturally? Do you believe that? Now, and you're not going to shake your head no while the pastor's looking at you. So I, I get that. I know what the Sunday school answer is here, but, but seriously... Do you believe that when you walked in that door, that door this morning, you brought with you the presence, the very presence of supernatural presence of Jesus Christ in you, and with that gifts that he has chosen to give you to minister to one another inside this body and outside in the community? you really believe that? See, if you really believe that, that changes everything about you. What, if you could have any superpower, what, what would you want? I would love to fly. I, love to, I dream about flying. I'd, I'd love to fly. That would be my superpower. What would be your superpower? Huh? Invisibility? Okay. Got my cloaking device on today. I thought about that coming over the bridge this morning because people were cutting in front of me. I must have my cloaking device on. <laughs> Anybody else? Brave enough? Some of you are going... Yeah, I can't say that because if I had a superpower, I, I, I would, there's a list of people I'd want to get back at, but <laughs> never mind. <laughs> All right, we're going to quit in just a minute. But, but I want you to see the extent of this is that to each of us is given the gifts. Now, there's, if you want to know the passages in the New Testament for spiritual gifts, there's two twelves and two fours. Anybody know what they are? Two chapter twelves and two chapter fours. One of them's in Ephesians 4, right? You know the other four? four? Anybody? 1 Peter 4, where he divides the gifts in speaking gifts and serving gifts. And then there's two twelves. Romans and 1 Corinthians. Yes. So that's, we'll, we'll take a look at those over the next few weeks and talk about this issue. And the reason it's critical is that Paul is saying that it's, it's critical in this moment because that's what unity is based upon. It's based upon the working out of the character of Jesus Christ and the trini Trinitarian doctrine that we have, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, etc. But it's also worked out as I give you supernatural enablement, enablement to do things. Yeah, I'm just going to ask it again. Do you really believe that about yourself? Do you have any idea what that might be? Do you have any idea what your spiritual gifts might be? 
And there's all kinds of tests and things. You know, the Bible doesn't really command us to discover our spiritual gift. It doesn't command that. I'm going to show you in a passage uh, next week or so in Romans 12 how he reveals that to us. But I really want you to sense this morning that God is saying to you as a follower of Jesus, there's something about you that I have put in you that I want to come out. I want it to be experienced by other members of the body of Christ. I want the world to see it. I want to put myself on display in your life. You exist for that purpose. Some of you have amazing faith. Our oldest son, James, from the time he was a little boy, exhibited this incredible faith. And one story in particular was we were in need of a car, and, and he was probably three or four, four or five years old, four or five years old, and we prayed that God would give us a car. And, and the next evening, a group of men gave us a car. But what was interesting about the prayer was we prayed like adults and he prayed like a child. And at the end of the prayer, he said, and Jesus, can you give me a red car? <laughs> and there it was, a red Toyota. It's unbelievable. It's the kind of faith that causes him to pick up his family and go to New York City and to live there and try to plant the gospel there and so forth. Some of you have the gift of giving. I see all kinds of spiritual gifts. God wants us to be stirred, to be aware of what he's put in us. And I'll show you in the next week or so a very specific biblical process we go through so that when you get to the end of that process, you can say with confidence and have confirmed by the mature people around you with confidence what the giftedness is that God has given you. Worship team, come up here. Um, we'll pick up uh, next week um, the specific gifts that he's talking about in this passage are the gifted people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those specific gifts given to the church for a specific purpose. And we'll pick that up next week. Thanks for coming and uh, being part of our, our uh, worship this morning.